Welcome to the last webinar in the series for the preparation for practice. Rex and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, our waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and emerging. I would like to welcome my co-convener, Ms. Marilyn Raj, who would join us uh, to put forward some of her insights regarding tonight's topic towards the end of the webinar. And once again, I would also like to thank Catherine Walsh and Virginia Consolo for putting the series together. When we started this webinar series all those weeks ago, we thought that we would be in a different place by now and that all the difficulties faced with the pandemic would have been behind us. Yet here we are six weeks down the track and the problem appears unending. So tonight's topic, doctors' health and well-being, could not be more timely or appropriate. It is great that you have all uh, learned about setting up your surgical practices, but all will be naught if you, the key to your practice, are not well. So please, please, please take care of yourselves, especially in these difficult times. So before I hand over to our first speaker, uh, Long Wing from VDHP, just a reminder to use a chat function to get your questions in so that we can have a good Q&A at the end of the webinar. And also, please remember to give us feedback through our forms at the end of the webinar um, to give us some pointers to how we can make this a better webinar series in the future. And please seek out our speakers for any questions after the webinar as they are more than happy to respond to your queries. All, the, all of the details are in the College P4P site. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Long Wing from VDHP. Thank you, Long, for presenting tonight. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Patrick. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, Virginia, could I get my slides started, please? So uh, welcome from the VDHP. Uh, my name's Long Yuan. I'm the Rural Program Manager and Medical Educator for the, for the Victorian Doctors' Health Program. Uh, next slide, please. Please interrupt at will. Um, I'm okay with that. If you have any questions, just bear in mind I'm not a clinician. Um, so if there are any questions of a clinical matter, uh, I'll take note and get back to you or give, give us a call. Uh, we are open 24 hours. Next, next slide, please, Virginia. So who are we and what do we do? We're, uh, we're really unique. Before uh, the pandemic, we were the only service in Australia which was free, confidential, independent um, and available 24 hours, but we, had a, we were the only one that was available face-to-face -face. and that was no bulk billing, no billing whatsoever. And doctors could come in, doctors or medical students could come in and have a chat with another doctor about any kind of concerns, whether it be kind of, uh, I guess, anything, mental or physical or whatever. And, you know, the, the idea of that confidentiality thing is something, a, a tenant that we hold very uh, dear and very strong. If a participant were to come in, and we call them participants because we're a program, if a participant were to come in um, and they didn't want to identify themselves or reveal or have any notes or anything like that, they could request that and we would respect that. So it's completely confidential in that sense. Um, we, we, since COVID, we've had to switch to phones or video or te a teleconference, um, but we've all opened up our psychologist too. So we have a resident psychologist by the name of uh, Ms. Cheryl Weil and she's been with the organisation since the beginning almost, so close to 20 years she's been with the VDHP. Now, we're open to all doctors and medical students as well, uh, and that's past or present as well. Um, so much so that one of our former medical directors actually uh, did a, a Zoom call with a doctor who'd studied in Melbourne or Victoria, but they were, at the time they were living in the UK. And so they organised it that they could kind of conference and have a chat. So that, that's, how, that's how open we are and that's how willing we are to help, really. Um, 
We also have a, a treatment panel or a referral network of GPs and specialists. So if one didn't have uh, their own GP, it's something that we uh, widely recommend. Uh, you can give us a call and tell us where you live and we'll, we'll find a doctor in your area. And so well, a lot of our calls and a lot of, a lot of the stuff we do there is related to that as well. And, and last but not least, uh, one of the other things we do is a case management and, and groups. So AOD, we have an AOD group called Caduceus, which meets uh, every Monday in the evening via Zoom now. And uh, I'm not going to say it's popular, but it, it does uh, serve a purpose. And, and uh, yeah, the, the, there are a few attendees there. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we really, and we deal with a lot at the VDHP is stress. Stress and burnout, and I'm just gonna to touch on it a little bit. Now, stress is something that is unavoidable. You're never gonna kind of live your life without kind of hitting it. And a little bit is good, and I'm gonna be a bit pseudo-scientific in that term that some of you may have heard called the flow state, where you stress, and your performance kind of match, and so you, you, you perform quite well. And, and it's like muscles, really. A little bit of stress can kind of be beneficial for you, and, but too much can kind of lead to burnout. Uh, next slide, please. Now, stress can come in kind of internal and external. Internal is up to the individual, but external, everyone kind of has. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, too, is that... Uh, Although you are doctors and you're pillars of society and everything, you're also very vulnerable to the human condition, unfortunately, just like everyone else. And so problems externally, stress, deadlines, work, a pandemic, all those things are going to affect you just like everyone else, I'm afraid. Um, next slide, please. And so just briefly, stages of burnout after stress. You're over-enthusiastic. And this is something that's, I guess, important when you start to go out into practice as well. Um, you're very enthusiastic. You might take on too much and then you start neglecting yourself a little bit going, Oh, well, I'll work a little bit later. I'll I won't eat. And, you know, I'll skip lunch today or I'll stay a bit back later and I'll skip dinner. And, you know, you're dismissive of your own problems and, and you focus only on work and then you start becoming intolerant of others and irritable and cynical. Um, now one of the things that we, we say is doctor's health is is personal it's all about you and so you really have to kind of know yourself in, in, in these things and if you don't you can ask some of your friends or family as well to kind of pick up on cues and everything so you really need to know your own cues and if you don't have one uh, and you know you might be able to ask some someone that might help you there uh, next slide so social withdrawal family and friends become concerned and then you start becoming detached, become a zombie through lack of sleep and, you know, just exhaustion. You start feeling empty, lost, unsure, exhausted. The future starts feeling bleak and dark and then physical exhaustion. So at, one of our former medical directors actually collapsed in practice and that was through burnout and they now have a pacemaker. So it, it can be quite serious. Uh, next slide, please. So barriers to seeking help. This is something that... We, we come across and we, we hear a lot is that, you know, it's denial. And this is a real dad joke, uh, but it's not just that river in Egypt. Um, the stigma and fear of being judged, that's, that's quite a, a big one. And it's something that uh, a lot of people have been working with and, and, and working on, I guess, like some individuals like Jeff Toogood and uh, Dr. Yumiko Kadota as well have kind of been, I guess, uh, shedding light on, on the vulnerabilities and all that uh, of doctors and, and, and trying to use that as a strength. And, and it is a strength. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to, to put your hand up and, and say, hey, I need help. Uh, fear of mandatory report. Now, that, that's, that's, that's a really big fear. I, I, I did uh, last year and one, that was one of the concerns that was brought up. Now, it, I can tell you... Uh, with in regards to the Victorian Doctors Health Program, in the 20 years or so that they we've been opened, um, only about three three people have been reported by us, um, and so it has to be very severe. And, and, and with the new guidelines too, it has to be quite severe and has to be uh, the doctor 
the individual has to pose it, I guess, uh, be a danger to the public. So mental health and all those things were, were one of the things that the doctors were concerned about, kind of revealing, but it's not such an issue. And it, and it shouldn't be an issue for, for one to get help. Now, ego, is that just a dirty word? In one sense, yes, and the other, no. So there's two sides of the coin, I guess. Ego can drive you and get you to where you're going, but it also can be your detriment. And it goes back to uh, what we were saying before about you know being over-enthusiastic and taking on too much and all that. And so something that has to be really uh, kept in check, I guess. And, and um, yeah, bad habits now. I was reflecting on, on, on bad habits and I, I think the term bad habits is kind of, it's not very a good term, I guess, because uh, I think a better way would to describe it may be uh, beneficial or comforting habits. Um, so, you know, getting up early and, and going for a walk would, would be considered beneficial, whereas staying in bed and, and not getting your daily exercise and all that. Uh, may be considered as being, or probably not that one so much, but maybe having a glass of wine or, or having that extra dessert or something can be more comforting and, and, and not so beneficial, even though, you know, you've got to have a balance of all these things. Um, role reversals. Now, they're not really, it's quite hard once you've been the doctor for a while as well to kind of become the patient. Um, and that leads back to being the ego as well, one's ego being able to kind of swallow your pride a little bit and go and just embracing your vulnerability, uh, which takes a lot of strength, as I said, but being able to do that, that, that can be quite hard. But uh, one of the things that we have on our wall in the office, and it's just a little note, a uh, handwritten note, and it just said, thank you for listening without judging. And that's something that we hold dear at the VDHP, that we do, everything we do is without judgment. Um, access, time and distance. Time is one. Distance, not so much now in the pandemic. Everything's virtual anyway. Um, but a access might be too. And I guess with time, everyone's overworked and probably with, the, with things happening now, with the current climate in Victoria, things probably will be a bit more, I guess, hectic in that sense as well. So time may be a bit more um, of a luxury or a commodity. Uh, next slide, please. How can we help? So we're the first point of call. And so we, we, we like to triage, but we could also be the last point of call, but just give us a call 24 hours. Uh, we support stress and burnout. We manage referrals to APRA as well. Once upon a time, we had a very good dialogue with APRA where we would be referred as part of a condition for a doctor to, to return to work and stuff. Um, and that seeing us was part of the con, part of their conditions and everything. It's something that we're looking at uh, reopening and and, and reestablishing. Uh, return to work. Uh, we're more than happy to do that as well. Support doctors there. Um, and as I said before, listening without judgment or prejudice. That that's a really big key one. Um, something we also do is docs for docs. So docs for docs is training for doctors to. Uh, have doctor patients or to be doctors for other doctors uh, we we usually run two a year it's been a bit different now because of COVID uh, but we'll probably look at trying to run one maybe virtually uh, in, in the not too distant future I guess now every doctor needs a GP including GPs and if you don't have one um, we can find one for you and so, yeah, leading back to the Docs for Docs, we had the training session there, but now we're, we're probably going to do it via telehealth. Now, we also manage a referral network across the states uh, of Victoria and Tasmania, and probably most important of all, we're, we're here if needed. Now, we don't want you to come per se, but if you need to come, then we're, we're always going to be open. And so you can call any time of day and you'll be able to speak to a doctor on, on the other line, I guess. Uh, next slide, please, Virginia. Now, one of the other system supports, this is a, a wider thing that I thought this is relatively new as well, and it's part of the, the National Doctor HS, which is the federal one that kind of um, oversees all us in Victoria, Tasmania, and the other states, SA, New South Wales. Um, it's a new initiative called Doctors for Doctors. 
Now, they're a new free support network, Australia-wide, um, and it's also connected to a website which has lots of online resources as well and some training if you wanted to become a, a, a doctor for other doctors as well. But the, 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 I guess the latest thing that they've done is a confidential telehealth service specifically for, for mental health for doctors and medical students. Um, and it's a great one. It's 1300 374 377, which roughly which relates to or converts to 1300 doctor for doctors. And so it's a triage service and you get up to three counselling sessions of one hour each with a doctor as well. So it's something else that if you, if you didn't feel comfortable talking to us, you can talk to these guys as well. And so you'll get a doctor and that's at any time, 24 hours, completely free. So yeah, next slide, please. Now, how to help yourself. Really specific. I, I really can't labour this point too much. Have your own GP. Yeah. Um, get some personal supervision. Have a mentor or a coach. Um, do some mindfulness training, some yoga, some relaxation, um, some balance Schwartz rounds as well. So that's something spe specific to, I guess, the, the medical profession and the medical field, but it's something that some of our clinicians in the past have done and have run and call someone who cares as well and get some professional support as well and call us, I guess. Um, when I talk about call someone who cares, when you work, try and minimise the, the banter and the, the negative talk with your co colleagues because um, what we've found is that it kind of just breeds, kind of kind of festers and creates a negative environment. So if you can kind of remove yourself and talk to someone that's a bit independent, it ends up being more beneficial as well in that sense. Uh, next slide, please. And get a life outside of work in medicine. Uh, listen to yourself. So you really have to know yourself and, and know what triggers you and what, what kind of sets you off and, and exercise and nutrition as well. So, you know, these are, these are pretty basic things. Half an hour a day, eat healthy food. What does Michael Pollan say? I think it was Michael Pollan. He said, you know, eat, eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. That's pretty kind of a, a good mantra to, to live by and have sleep. Now, sleep um, is a really important one and have sleep good hygiene as well. So try and maintain routine with that to kind of help maximise the amount of sleep. Now, it's hard being a doctor and, and sleeping because you, you, you're time poor, but if you can kind of keep that regular and try and um maximize that then it's really going to help you because obviously lack of sleep is going to cause a lot of problems there i mean i think the cia use or i won't say the cia but people have used sleep deprivation as a form of torture so it's really important uh minimize those little helpers so those little helpers could be a glass of wine some beers um try and minimize those um i'm a teetotaler so i don't have any kind of understanding of that my, my, my vice is uh staying up too late and eating junk food too much junk food and drinking too much coca-cola so yeah um in terms of hobbies uh create something but it doesn't really need to you don't really need to do something that creative but you're know, creating something that can be quite cathartic hobbies obviously a little bit limited now in victoria um so be creative uh my hobby in the past was um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which I was more than a hobby for me. It was a passion. Um, obviously, with the new laws and everything, I haven't been able to do that. So I've picked up, at 39 years old, I've picked up skateboarding as something that I can do on the streets. So be, be creative and um, you know, think outside the box and do something that kind of gets your mind and keeps you in the moment, I guess. Um, stay connected as well. So there's lots of various options now. Uh, obviously, you can't meet people face-to-face -face as much, but this was something that the psychologist wanted me to pass on as well, that um, being, being connected is really important, especially now. Um, yeah. And, and always checking on your colleagues as well. As well. So when, when, I say help, when we say help yourself, help others as well. Keep, out, keep an eye out. For, for others, you know, the person that's just moving, the person looks like they're struggling, 
but also the person looks like they're doing really well and, and not struggling at all. You don't know what's going on inside their head. So it's, it's worthwhile just having that chat and that, um, you know, just asking that question, are you okay? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And, and most of all, don't be like this doctor, I guess. Uh, don't bury your head in the sand and, you know, don't don't it's 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 better to kind of come come to us early or get help earlier than it is later uh next slide please and, and just to summarize so the vdhp and the the tdhp is you know 24 hours um for the tasmanian residents it's 1-800 is a free call the the doctor for doctors phone number as well ama peer support i think starts from 8 to 11 or around there or 9 to 9 to 11 uh, Lifeline Beyond Blue and, and Black Dog as well. So, yeah, next slide. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, probably not yet, uh, Long. Okay. We'll get through it to, we'll, we'll go get to all the questions at the um, at the end with our Q&A. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you for a great talk. And this is a very, very important uh, service you provide. Uh, I don't think is used or advertised enough. Um, as surgeons, we're very, uh, how would I say it, solo. You know, we're in a little cocoon. We, we don't tend to ask a lot of help, and by the time we ask a lot of help, uh, ask for help, it's sometimes quite late. So I'm, I'm glad that you presented this. Uh, uh, we'll get to the questions to you in a little while. Thank you again, Long. Um, so our next speaker is Melo Kalako, uh, a mindfulness coach. This field is almost always forgotten when we're dealing with our daily routine of surgical practice. But without a very healthy mind, there can be no healthy or even a prosperous practice. So I really encourage you to all listen uh, to Melo. And uh, welcome and thank you for presenting tonight, Melo. Hello, can you hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, I can. Yep, yep, go ahead. And you can see my screen. Good. Yes, thank you. And a uh, fantastic work there, Long. And I'm sure I'm going to consolidate a fair bit of what you said there earlier. And, um, and we actually might even turn it into a bit of a workshop where we'll actually workshop a bit of that and, and take some of those great tools that you mentioned and put it into a bit of a practice today. So my name is Mello, as you can see, Mello by name, Mello by nature, Mello the mindfulness meditation teacher. And uh, thank you for having me here today and uh, welcome everybody. There's my email address there in case there's any questions that pop up today and I don't get a chance to uh, answer them. Obviously this is quite a short session of about 30 odd minutes and I'm sure we won't get through all the Q&A, but there's my email address, there's my um, website and there's my LinkedIn profile if anybody has any concerns, questions or feedback afterwards, I'd love to hear from you. What we're going to cover cover today, basically, oops, sorry, a little tech problem there. What we're going to cover today is it's not work. Oh, um, maybe you haven't shared my screen. Sorry. Uh, let me go again. Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry about this, guys. Here we go. I'll go backwards here. It's uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so, so what we're going to cover today is self-care tips, um, some how to manage stress and burnout, which Long talked about already fair, uh, fair in fair detail. I'm going to workshop that a little bit today, and an introduction to mindfulness. Obviously, this being a short session, we won't have uh, much dur duration to do a longer practice, which I normally like to do, but we'll at least introduce the topic. And of course, we'd love to hear some Q&A um, towards the end. So I'll open up the chat box along the way. So if anything comes to mind throughout this talk today, just write in your questions, write in your challenges, write in anything that you want to add and we'll address that towards the end of the session. And a little, little bit just in a nutshell about a 30 second version of my background. I am a mindfulness coach and high performance coach and I, I teach mindfulness to various organizations. I work in four mental health clinics. I work with athletes, I work one-on-one -on -one with coach, um, coaching one-on-one -on -one with actually surgeons at the moment. A fair few surgeons are calling me up in this um, desperate time we're in right now. Um, executives, CEOs, and a whole range of people. And I really love sharing my passion 
and my knowledge on mindfulness and um, sharing it with as many people as possible. Obviously now it's more virtual, um, not in the boardroom as it used to be. Um, I miss that immensely, but I'm getting used to these virtual uh, things. Usually the technology works quite well for me, but um, a few glitches here. So this is some of the companies I work at and I'm increasing that all the time. And I'm really, really wrapped that a lot of companies are recognizing the importance of mindfulness in the workplace for you know, mental health, for stress resilience, for performance. Um, so I'm sure there's some familiar names up there. And one of my all time favorites there is the Bon Giorno group who are, you are also familiar with. And um, they actually presented here at this uh, Prep for Practice. I'm sure you've seen their faces around the place. And uh, I'm really wrapped. They also are great ambassadors for mindfulness and mental health. And I run um, weekly meditation sessions there at the moment during this whole and COVID lockdown type situation and I've run master classes there and six week courses and just in general that yeah great how they embrace that but also these other companies fantastic how they do that so it just shows the importance of mindfulness um, and especially in regards to stress during this time right now actually over the last two weeks I've got a, a flood of calls from companies saying help me Mello help me we are now our team is struggling uh, we need some help so you know, very important even more so than now than ever before and here's a dictionary definition of stress. And like I said, I'll consolidate a bit of what Long was saying before. A, a psychological or physical stimulus to the body that occurs whenever we must adapt to changing conditions, whether those conditions be real or perceived, positive or negative. And now I think the key word, especially for you guys here, is changing conditions. And these changing conditions are changing all the time. Well, at the moment, day by day, hour by hour, we're hearing new updates and things. And I got a little insight into the surgeon's world actually the other day when I was coaching one of the surgeons that I work with, an orthopedic pediatric surgeon, and he uh, divulged to me that surgeons don't really like change. They don't really like things changing. So um, it's a difficult world for you right now, and I understand that you know, surgeons are often quite precise, quite linear. Um, I might be generalizing here in some way, but you know, change is not good. Not many of us do anyway. So we need to adapt as much as possible. We need to be pliable as much as possible. We need to be flexible, open-minded. And the other key word in there, I think, is perceived too. You know, be careful of what you're perceiving. Obviously, there are real stressors that are happening, but sometimes we may spend a lot of energy and time in our mind perceiving catastrophic futures that may never even happen. So um, just being careful of that. So that's what I want to talk about today, stress. And the various stages, a bit like what Long was talking about, but I, I'm going to workshop it with you a little bit today. And it's normal that we have stress. It's a normal thing. It's a normal, every single day we have stressors. This is COVID or no COVID. We have you know, work-related stressors. We have deadlines. We have all sorts of problems. We have emails. We have technology. We have text beeping and buzzing at us all the time. And it's best to manage our stress on a, on a daily level. So this is the green zone, I call this. This is where you have stress, but you can manage it. You might have a little break. You see those spaces in between. You have a little break. You clean up. You do your next you know, job that you're doing or go from task to task. So that's a normal world. And we need to manage it in that green zone as much as possible before it gets worse. And right now in this current COVID situation, I'll double that particular stress. We're getting bombarded even more. The news, the media, the new restrictions, the changes that are happening all the time. So we need to deal with stress even more so on a daily basis. If not, I would even say at this time on an hourly basis or every couple of hours, whatever you can do to manage your stress. And that's really important. If you do that, you know, things can you know, go well and we can actually operate as a peak performer, as a high performer, do our best work, stay on task, be engaged and do the work that we're doing as best we can. As long as we recognize, you know, when it becomes stressful, we need to take little breaks as much as possible. If we don't do that and manage our stress in the green zone, it actually turns to what's called chronic stress. And many of us are experiencing this right now, you know, constant adrenaline going through the body, cortisol, we're overwhelmed, overstimulated, you know, bombarded all the time by new things and new stimuli all the time. And that gets worse. And that's, that's typically overwhelmed. And when you see someone that's chronically stressed, they're just busy and agitated, nervous, anxious, and in this world we're living in right now, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety. 
So it's a, a normal state in some ways, but it gets worse as we progress along the way. So in an ideal world, we manage our stress on a daily level in that green zone before it turns to chronic stress, because then it gets worse. It turns into what's called allostatic load, as you may be aware of, and that when it becomes constant wear and tear on the body. So this is a bit different to chronic stress. Chronic stress is more like overstimulated, overworked. This is like you're running out of energy. And I've noticed in the work that I do as a mindfulness coach and, and the work that I do in mental health, a lot of people are heading into this way right now. We're quite exhausted. And I've been monitoring this situation quite closely where initially this sort of COVID phase happened. There was a bit of excitement, almost a bit of like you know, uncertainty and fear all mixed up, which is more an heightened state. And then as we headed into more like the isolation and working from home and feeling socially disconnected and disconnected from our peers, we started a bit more depression and isolation and a little bit more of a, a down feeling. And now I'm noticing on this third phase or this you know, stage four for us here, a lot of us are just downright exhausted, just really tired. And um, this is what I'm noticing, a lot of the conversations I'm having now. So it's very different to two months ago or three months ago. And if we don't manage that, it just gets worse and worse. It turns into poor mental health and eventually burnout. And that's the progression um, that, that I've been seeing and, and experiencing with a lot of my clients and the people that I work with. So I'd rather see you and work with you and, and help you manage your stress in that green zone and that blue zone as much as possible. And if you can do that yourself, you can actually you know, go a long way. As opposed to that burnout zone, which I'm seeing a lot of right now, where it's a lot harder to get more functional again from that zone. And the two differences, if you look at the green and the blue zone, that's more like... Um, too much, too much, too much going on, overwhelmed, overstimulated. And then the orange and red zone is more like, I've got nothing left. There's nothing left in me, nothing left in the tank. My resources are low and that eventually leads to burnout. And like I said before, I do a lot of work in mental health clinics and um, you know, burnout is one of the, the major things that happens, which leads to poor mental health. So we want to catch it as much as we can and ask yourself, where, how do you feel right now? Are you managing your stress on a daily level? Or are you feeling a bit overwhelmed and you know, agitated? Or are you feeling a bit more in that orange zone or even towards that red zone right now? And this is very timely that we're doing this um, particular talk right now because I think people are heading a lot more into that orange and, and red zone. And I know, you know from, from working with a lot of doctors that many doctors do work you know, 50 to 70 hours per week. It's not you know, abnormal to do that, but you have to manage it in that you know, green zone as much as possible and do things for yourself. So that's uh, have a look at that yourself and you might even want to put in the chat box, you know, what zone do you feel in right now, whether it's the green zone or the orange zone or the red zone. If you want to share that with us, that'd be great. Um, I'll continue on and talk a little bit about the mental health. And this is a, a Beyond Blue slide you may be familiar with, you know, in the past and you know, they're great ambassadors for mental health. And, and I, would, I would say this is almost like obsolete right now. This is obviously pre-COVID, but um, you could pretty much double a lot of, the, a lot of those numbers right now. Just last week alone, I had three calls for suicide, um, a lot more anxiety, a lot more depression. So it's uh, very prevalent and relevant now. And I don't want to be the doomsday messenger here. I don't want to you know, paint the, the doom, doom and gloom thing. But I think we just need to be aware of it because nobody is exempt to this. Nobody's exempt to this. And especially the higher performer you are and the harder you work and the many hours you work, the more prone you are to this. So, and I've seen that a lot in the work that I do. And the other latest media release that just came out just the other day, actually, um, I saw it on Black Dog Institute, which is a great read, was more than three quarters of the people claim their mental health has worsened since the outbreak. And that was only measured between 27th of March to the 7th of April. So that was actually pre this next you know, lockdown phase or this next stage four phase. So it'll be really interesting to see what statistics come out of this next phase. So it's, it's real, it's prevalent, it's relevant, and yeah, it's everywhere. And I just you know, want you all to be aware of it yourself and you know, have your own self-care as much as possible, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I'll even get you to action some of that. But um, you know, really be aware of it. And look after yourself, number one, and look after the people around you as much as possible. And if you see any red flags, you know, support people as much as you can right now. And in, in an ideal world, you know, we have this nice balance of, you know, parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity. Sympathetic is that fight and flight mode, that, you know, that working, you know, working long hours, demanding work, but you need to have that balance of you know, deactivating the stress response. 
and deactivating that fight and flight response as much as possible and enter that parasympathetic. And one of the best ways to do this actually to activate the parasympathetic nervous system is slow breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. You know, the moment you close your eyes and you breathe slower, you're, as you may know, the vagus nerve kicks in and it sends messages to the body and it kicks in the parasympathetic nervous system, the polar opposite to fight and flight. So we need to do that as much as possible, especially if you are working those 50 and 70 hours a week. We, we are not machines. We cannot keep going and keep going and keep going all the time. We need to actually back off and find some downtime, whether that is meditation or whether that is your hobbies or whether that is just a rest or you know, a break of some, some way, any sort of downtime that you can do will help you to balance that in the ideal world. So that's what I see. And that's what we're going to talk about today, actually how to actually action that today, how to actually do some of that. Um, and that leads me to self-care 101. And I'm sure, you know, being doctors and surgeons, you know the body better than me and you're you know, very familiar with it and you know this stuff. It's very, very fundamental. And I would say it's common sense. But really, common sense is not always common practice. So I'm going to enter on a very fundamental level today, being this very short session. And we're going to take action on some of these things today, just to really look after yourself. Because I have noticed in this particular situation we're in right now, that you know, people are neglecting a lot of these things, your physical health and your mental health. So what I'll ask you to do before we go on, if you have a piece of paper and a pen with you, that'd be great. We're going to workshop this in a real quick fashion. And all you need to do is write physical energy on the top and mental energy on the top and, and just do a little grid of six. So one line down the middle and two across there. Physical on one side, mental on the other. And if you don't have a pen and paper, you might want to use your iPad or whatever you have or scribble it on the back of a napkin or something for now. We're just going to just action some of this to make it real because you know, with mindfulness practices or with exercise or anything, unless you actually do something, you don't get the benefits. I mean, you can read all the books you like about mindfulness. You can read all the books you like or do all the courses you want and you know, study it cognitively and understand it theoretically. But unless you do the practice, you don't get the benefit. It's like exercise. Unless you, you know, do the exercise itself, you're not going to get the benefits. So that's why we're going to action it. So if you've got a little piece of paper and a grid written up there, we're going to go through these one by one and we're going to actually just write down a few little tips. I'll give you some and you can share some and you, you can use some of the ones that you're doing yourself now. Number one is regular exercise. Are you actually doing some regular exercise yourself right now? You know, I know it's more difficult in this lockdown situation. I know gyms are closed. I know that you know, it's, we can't leave our postcode, for example, here in Victoria. But what are you doing on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to get your body moving? Whether that's a walk, whether that's a little run, whether that's you know, doing an online yoga class or um, Pilates class or even a high-intensity HIIT class or aerobic type class, whatever it is, what are you doing in there? So write down in your little list there on exercise, write down two or three things that you could do every day. The thing that I do every single day, and I haven't broken this for many years, is my morning walk. I do a brisk morning walk in the morning, and that's followed by about a 20-minute meditation, Tai Chi practice, and then I have a healthy breakfast. But my morning walk is how I start the day. That's not negotiable, and I do that every day. And I'd say I've done that for about 25 years. And then I do afternoon exercise of you know, maybe some you know, body work or some martial arts or something like that. But I always do my morning walk. So please write down at least one, two or three little bullet points on your regular exercise. And you may have to get creative. You know, if you're a bike rider, obviously you can't you know, be drumming the streets anymore. You may need to get some technology in your shed. I heard there's something called Ride or um, uh, one of those Strava things where you can actually ride in the garage and it measures you and you ride against people in New York. You can actually run marathons, um, ride marathons. So any way you can get creative with that would be great. So that's your exercise. Write down a few. Um, sorry. And then the next one is nutrition. And I'm not going to teach nutrition here. I'm sure you're very aware of nutrition. But what are you doing for your own nutrition right now? And typically, these are the things that go out the window in these situations when we are stressed, when we are busy, when we're overstimulated. And now we're working from home, we might have more access to the, to the pantry or the fridge or our eating habits have changed. But first of all, what are you doing? Are you having a healthy breakfast? Are you potentially making a smoothie of some sort? Or are you eating regular meals? And that's a big one for your you know, mental energy to keep that glucose level up through your body. Are you eating more mindfully? You know, are you eating away from the computer? As research says, if you eat in front of the computer, you get hungry 
20 minutes later because your brain hasn't registered that you've eaten. And that's the, a great opportunity to bring mindfulness to your day. You leave the computer behind, turn off your distractions and just eat. Um, and just maybe it's a, a point of avoiding certain things like avoiding you know, too much coffee or stimulants or sugar, whatever it is. But if you can just write down two or three, that'd be great. And I'll move on to the next one. Adequate sleep, and this will also extend on what um, Long was talking about. It's so important. Essentially, if we don't sleep well, we don't function well. Like it's really 101 in that way. And, and I know a lot of people now, and I've been working with a lot of people suffering insomnia and tossing and turning at, at night time and you know, can't sleep with all this situation we're in. But definitely we need to sleep. So how can you get better sleep? So I'll get you to write some tips down. Personally, I turn off my devices at a certain time at night. So I turn off all my computer and my laptops, my devices, my phone, my um, iPads and things. So I log off at a certain time. And that signals to me, works over, and then I'm entering into my evening. And then I, I personally do a meditation practice. But whatever it is for you to wind down a little earlier in the evening, maybe you dim the lights, maybe you have a bath, maybe you um, have a herbal tea. What can you do to create a regular, healthy sleep routine? So if you just write down two or three, maybe it's just no screen time at a certain time. Maybe it's a, a meditation practice, a two or three minute breathing practice. Just finding some healthy ones. So that's the physical stuff. We need to have that because fundamentally, if we don't have the physical aspect right, the mental clarity is not there either. And we'll go to the mental side here. So regular renewal breaks. I always recommend this. And I know it's hard you know, when you are in surgery and things like that to have that. But whenever you can claim five minutes to yourself or 10 minutes to yourself, please claim it as much as you can. And I know you often have back-to-back -back things going on, but trying to have regular renewal breaks. That just might be a cup of tea. It might be a quick, brisk walk outside. It might be a change of scenery. And especially now we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings and things. I've been hearing a lot of Zoom fatigue. And actually one doctor I was talking to recently was talking about our field of vision as being impaired because we don't actually get that depth of vision. Like obviously when you go from meeting to meeting or place to place, it changes all the time. But typically now we're just looking at a two dimensional screen, whether you're doing you know, telehealth or whether you're zooming all day, um, it's becoming a problem and it's optical muscles behind their eyes are getting lazier. So whatever you can do, walk outside, look at the trees, take the dog for a quick walk, whatever you can do, um, to take renewal breaks. And if you are you know, in the practice or working in a clinic, whatever you can do just to claim 10 minutes to yourself. Very important. We, we, we are not machines, like I said. The next one there is to do some mental stimulation outside of work. And now is an opportunity that you potentially could take up a new hobby. There's a bit more home time, definitely, um, you know, doing something that might stimulate your brain in a different way. And it's great for stress reduction. It's great for you know, doing things like that. My youngest daughter, she's eight, and she's learning guitar at school. So she's teaching me a few little um, little tunes and things. So that's, I've been taking up guitar with her, having a little bit of play with her, which is great. So it takes my mind off of work. I'm just there being fully present. So just looking at hobbies, what could you do? Write down something, mental stimulation out of work. It might be learn a new language. It might be you know, do something a bit different, take up a hobby, get creative. Anything that engages your senses in a different way outside of work is really, really important. So let you write one or two of them down. And last but not least is my, my favorite thing, of course, being an ambassador and advocate for mindfulness and meditation. Meditation of some sort, you know, whether that's a two minute meditation break, whether it's a 10 minute meditation break, whether it's a five minute meditation, whatever it is we can do just to deactivate that stress response. Because mindfulness is a fantastic tool to de 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 excuse me, deactivate the amygdala, that fight and flight response, and to actually strengthen that prefrontal cortex. So every day that I meditate, it inspires me that I'm actually strengthening and sharpening my prefrontal cortex and creating new neural pathways in there, and I'm deactivating the amygdala, the fight and flight response, or the stress center of the brain. So out of all those six things there, I'll get you to write a few little points there. And to make this really, really practical today, I'm going to ask you to get your red pen out or your marker or your highlighter or that pen that you have in your hand and choose one from each column and circle it loud and clear and make it not negotiable. Make it not negotiable. Let's say for this next six week lockdown, let's say your not negotiable is I'm going to walk every day and you just do it every single day and you time your calendar around it and you do that one thing. 
because I'm, I'm a big one on just doing one thing and just really sticking to one thing. That way there you can create the habit and then you can anchor other things. Like myself, I do my morning walk at six or seven o'clock in the morning and then I do my, my meditation straight after and then I have a healthy breakfast. So circle loud and clear, you're not negotiable on there. Like really, really clear, make it clear and tangible. So if it's nutrition, you might say I'm gonna eat more salad or I'm gonna eat something else or some soups or I'm gonna have breaks, I'm gonna have a healthy breakfast, whatever it is. Circle that and to make it more accountable, if you're open to this, I'm gonna invite this out to the group here. Research says that you are more, um, you would do it, you're more likely to do it if you actually tell somebody about it. So if you wanna write in your chat box, you're not negotiable. You're not negotiable for the next, let's say 30 days or six weeks, whatever you want to do. What is your not negotiable? One from the physical side, one from the mental side. If you want to share it, fantastic. And we can talk about it later when we pop out out of the chat box there. But I think that's really important. And you know, going back to that previous slide, this is your way to manage your mental health on a daily basis. Back in that green zone that you're in before. You know, really managing it on a daily level, eating well, sleeping well, getting your regular exercise, meditating, doing some hobbies and some interests and taking renewal breaks. And I'm not asking you to change all those six all in one day, but at least one. If you can change one, you can then you know, keep anchoring there. So I'd love to see in the chat box later on how you, if you, anybody has written anything in there, please help me out. Please write one thing. If it's just walking or something like that, I'd love to hear. And that you know, brings us to mindfulness, and mindfulness you know, obviously is a, a buzzword these days, and it's important. And I would say even more so than now. You know, Harvard Business Review put it really nicely, where they say mindfulness should no longer be considered a nice to have; it's a must have. It's not a luxury to, to have it; it's a must have right now. And definitely in the work that I do with mental health, I'm seeing that you know, mindfulness is a very powerful tool and technique to use. I would say a lot right now because a lot of people. People are spending a lot of time in their mind, in their thoughts, and they're actually um, anxious about the future. Obviously, you know, will I have my job still? Will I lose my income? What's going to happen next week? We don't know with all this uncertainty. So we spend a lot of our mental energy and capacity in what-if scenarios. What if this happens? What if I can't provide for my family? What if I lose my job? What if I don't have any work? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if keeps going? And we spend a lot of our mental energy there which actually robs us of our performance. It robs us of our capacity to stay positive and, and present. Whereas practicing mindfulness, it actually teaches us to be present with what is. What is happening now? And I have a saying that you, you can always deal with the what is. You can always have the resources you need to deal with what is happening in the present moment, step by step, hour by hour, day by day. You always have those resources. You don't have the resources to deal with the future things because they haven't happened yet and it's not possible to do with them. You'll do with them as they unfold and, and, and go there. And that's where mindfulness training really can help you with that. So in some way, if you could take it up in some way, um, I've got some you know, free meditations I can offer you. Um, at the end of the session, I can um, pass on my email address, I can share them with you. I can help you out in any way to do that. I'd love to do that. And the benefits are countless. I wouldn't have a screen big enough, but you know, I won't spend too much time on this, but basically less reactive to stress and also how to stay calm under pressure, which is obviously very important to, to you guys there. Manage overwhelm and anxiety, performance. So I'll just punch them all up here. Improve your immune function and well-being, which is also very important right now. Increase your mental focus and clarity and improve sleep patterns. Who wants that? We all do. That's actually one of the biggest byproducts I see with a lot of my clients when they first take on mindfulness practice or meditation practice. They say to me, oh, Mella, I had the, the best night's sleep ever, the best sleep I've had for a decade because they've actually processed their thoughts for the day. When they go to bed at night, they have a, a, a nice sleep. So all of those benefits there, and like I said, I wouldn't have a, a screen you know, big enough to do this. So that's the, the practice of mindfulness and I encourage it a lot. And this is a bit of how to do it. So like I said, unless you actually do the practice, you don't get the benefits. And there's two main ways. And one is what's called the formal practice and one is what's called the non-formal practice. And the formal practice is basically your stereotypical idea of what meditation is. You know, so, you know, closing your eyes, stopping, you know, stepping away from the computer and doing a practice. And normally you use your breath as an anchor or your body as an anchor or some, something to stay anchored in, 
the present moment. And typically I'll, I'll say around about five to 10 minutes is a great practice, but I also say just stopping and doing a 90 second breath break and following your breath for 90 seconds is also a great way to do that. So just closing your eyes, following your breath. If I had more time, I'd share that with you today, but I, I'm limited on time to do that. But um, So just doing a formal practice of some way, you can do that with an app. You could listen to an app with or without audio guidance, or you could just you know, stop and just deactivate the stress by just stopping. A good goal is around 10 minutes a day. The other way to practice mindfulness is your non-formal practice. Now this is doing all those other 10,000 things that you do in your day, but you do them more mindfully. You do them with more presence. You do them with more attention. And by doing this, you train your attention to actually stay focused on task. And anything from you know, waking up in the morning to showering to eating to walking to you know, cooking to listening to people, but you do them with more attention. And in my eyes, this is equally important, if not more important, because many people spend their whole day in a distracted state. They're doing one thing, but they're thinking of another thing or their, their mind is you know, flicking away here, there and everywhere. And with mental health, that's part of the problem. They may be ruminating about the past or they may be thinking about the future and you know, worrying about the future or being anxious about the future and not fully present. And the research does say that we are the happiest when we are on task, when we are present with what we're doing. The other research says that we are actually 47% of the time off task so we need to train our attention to be on task. I'm sure when you're doing your job and you're doing your surgery and doing that, you're, you're on task and you're very present, you know, but we have to train our attention to do that for longer periods of time. So that's the two practices, the, the formal practice, where you have to stop and actually close your eyes, and then the non-formal practice. And I say they are equally weighted. And both of them will train your attention to be more focused, to be on task, to you know, be more present, and to actually really enjoy life more fully in, in a nutshell. So you could actually go back and to, to your list that you made there of that, those six things. And let's say it was walking, for example, you could use that as your mindfulness. So when I'm walking, I'm just walking. I don't have my phone with me. I'm not checking things on my text. I'm not doing anything. One really good tool if you want to try it out is to try not to have your telephone by your bedside. Not easy. I know, but it's a really good one where often the first hour of the day, you, you know, you wake up in the morning, you check your phone, you, you scroll, you might check your emails or something buzzes and beeps, whatever it is, and you're thrown into work immediately. You are no longer in your bedroom just waking up. So if you can, if it's possible, obviously, if you're not on call or anything, not have your telephone by your bedside. And it's not easy, but one particular CEO that I work with, um, we, we did that, it took us about three months to do that. And he no longer has a telephone by his bedside. And he says, oh, my God, it's fantastic. I own my morning. It's like having a two-hour holiday every single day. So it's a you know, really good thing to try. But just try one thing to do more mindfully. Eating could be a good one. So where when you're eating, you're just eating. No telephones, no computers, no distractions. Step away from what you're doing and just only eat. You're really a really good practice to do. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, the, the, the way to do it. Obviously, I don't have time to take you through a practice today. I would love to, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you access to some meditations in some way. Some sort of mindfulness practice is really good right now in this particular environment. You might even use this next six weeks as your opportunity to learn meditation. And I know meditation is not for everybody. I, I've heard the barriers over and over again. But what about if I said, if you just stopped for 10 minutes and had some downtime in some way, your next three hours, Hours will be productive, will be more efficient, will be more focused, you'll be sharper. And it's a really good way. And when I actually teach meditation to a lot of the executives, the corporate executives that I work with, I don't even use the word meditation because meditation can sometimes bring this sort of connotations of, you know, dreadlock hair and hippies and chanting om and incense. It's not about that. It's about you know, sharpening your mind, being more focused. And I work with athletes actually and, um, you know, high performance on that level and they're not doing it to burn incense, they're doing it to be the best at what they can do. I'm just going to round this off. Here's your homework, guys. Here's your homework. Five to ten minutes practice um, to do something to do more mindfully. And that self-care habit, that one not negotiable. I'd love to hear what your not negotiable is. Once we pop out into the chat box, I'd love to hear what that is. And there's my details again, as you can see, mellow at mindfulmoves.com. Note the double O. You can screenshot that if you need that. Um, 
there's my website. And I also have, if you'd like to send me an email, I have a free COVID package or a free mindfulness support package. Send me an email and I can just send that directly to you. It's a great package and a lot of people are benefiting from it. But there's some meditations, there's some video tips and there's some handouts to help you out. And I see Patrick's popping up on the screen. He's probably telling me to start getting on moving there. <laughs> so um, we can open up the q and I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to hear some questions. I'd love to hear if you could possibly actually open up the, the chat, chat box with maybe any challenges or any struggles that might be happening right now if you're open to it um, or any feedback of this you know, latest particular lockdown situation. If we can help you in any way, that's what we're here for. We're here to support you. We're here to help you in any way. And we might be able to answer one question for you here right now, or if not, via email later on. So I'll um, pop out of that there. And excellent, I'll excellent. Thank you so much, Mello. Yes, please uh, pop us a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Mello's here, Long's here to answer these questions. So keep, keep typing, uh, keep typing away. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Mello. Um, Tremendous advice. Um, your talk just proves that COVID really sucks because <laughs> a face-to-face -face workshop with your advice would have been absolutely fantastic. Mm. It, it would have been what we needed right now, but you know, paradoxically, we can't have it right now because we're all stuck, stuck in our houses. Um, I really enjoyed the, uh, the session. Um, so uh, whilst you guys are putting in your one not negotiables, I know there's a few on there, but there's only like four, three or four, and there's more attendees than that. We need 24. 24. <laughs> 24. Get in there. Get in there. Um, whilst you're putting that in, and also any questions you have for Nello, uh, for Nello and, uh, and Long, I want to like to introduce my uh, co convener Ms. Marilyn Raj. Uh, great work for all the webinars so far, Marilyn. Um, she'll say a few words from a surgeon's perspective regarding tonight's topic. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, um, look, this is a really, really important topic. And I think our two speakers, Long and Mello, have done a remarkable job in actually summarising the importance of looking after yourself. Um, I think for most of us who have gone through medical school and surgical training, we probably know about what um, is the things that keep us enjoying life. The difficulty is that when we're starting out in our private practice, we often have to make a lot of sacrifices to actually, you know, kickstart the practice. And what, what I found um, looking back is that the things that I sacrificed were actually my own personal time. And in hindsight, I can sort of say to you now, it's not a very good thing to sacrifice. And my accountant actually put it to me in a very financial way. And he said, look, when you work as a surgeon, you're actually earning your income through what's called personal exertion, okay? Now, if you're not fit and healthy and of, you know, feel positive about the work that you do, then that's going to affect your um, performance and potentially it's going to affect your income. So it's actually financially important that you look after yourself because you're in this business not for five and 10 years, but probably for 30 years, okay? So looking after yourself is important from a financial point of view. It's important because you look after yourself and you know, you're, you're part of a bigger family. So it means that you're actually looking after yourself for your your spouses and for your kids as well. Um, what were the challenges that I found? I found that time was the biggest challenge. We are always being torn in 20 different directions every five minutes of our day. Um, you know, most of us will work in both private and public, um, in both private practice and in public hospitals. When you're in the public hospitals, there's that your time is taken up with teaching the registrars, doing whatever admin that you need to do. Um, and in private practice, your time's taken up with managing your staff 
checking that their well-being is okay and that you're actually instituting the correct management plan for your patients. So how do you then work out where you can find time for yourself? I think planning was probably the most important thing for me. So what I did was I looked, I work on a four, four week timetable, rotating timetable, and every week's different. I had all of that inputted into my Google calendar so that I was always, I would check the night before and I knew, you know, I was operating at this public hospital the next morning and I'm in the rooms in the afternoon. The other thing that was important was how I planned when I could be on call. So, for example, you know, if you know that you've got a um, private hospital operating list um, that, that, that's going to demand a lot of your energy, it's probably best not to put yourself or not to nominate to be on call the next day because you almost need a day to catch up and have a bit of a break. Okay, and you know that you're going to be doing an early morning ward round in the private hospital the following morning anyway. So if you're being stressed by phone calls coming from the public hospital while you're trying to get up and do the ward round, already the day started to become a bit of a disaster and you never really sort of catch up after that. So I think planning and being a bit selfish about when you accept to do on call is really, really important. The other thing is a colleague of mine gave me some really good advice and he said, you know, when you first start out picking operating lists in the private hospital, the only lists that are, are left by the time, you know, they're offered up to you are the ones that nobody wants, which sometimes could be a Friday afternoon. Now, if you definitely don't want to do a list on a Friday afternoon for personal reasons, don't take it. Don't get sucked into thinking that if I don't take this list, I'm never going to get another list in this private hospital, etc. That's not the case. But you do have to look after yourself. And that's where I think it's important to be selfish. The other thing is when you feel that things are starting to pile up and it is starting to get stressful, talk to your colleagues. I've often, you know, caught up with my colleagues in the theatre tea room and had a 10 to 15 minute chat. It's an honest, open discussion about how we're feeling. And I found it particularly important during this second, you know, stage, stage four COVID shutdown, because I personally was feeling pretty upset by everything that was going on. So it's nice to be able to share um, in an honest way um, how we feel, because we're all human. And getting it off my chest was a really, really good thing and being able to appreciate that other people were also feeling the same way actually made me feel a whole lot better. Now, I'm not saying that, um, and that, that's not restricted to just the current environment that we're in. You'll find throughout your careers that there'll be times when things just become overwhelming. It's okay. We all get overwhelmed. Nobody is superhuman. And that was one of the hardest things for me to acknowledge because we go through medical school and we go through surgical training and you're almost trained to be a machine. And, you know, the mindset is, well, a machine never fatigues. I've got news for you. We're human. Uh, you know, we're not the bionic man and woman that, um, that we perceive ourselves to be and we have to allow ourselves to feel exhaustion and we have to recognise that we're exhausted because otherwise we're going to be our own worst enemy because we'll run ourselves into the ground and, um, uh, and we won't actually allow ourselves to thrive as surgeons. So I think that's really important to appreciate that we've all got limitations. Um, so organising, being strategic in where, how you take your on call, making sure that you don't allow your um, booking staff to overbook your operating lists. There's only, you don't have to, you know, tie yourself into oblivion to operate. There's always another day when you can, you know, do those cases as well. Um, make sure, and I know this is a bit hard at this point in time, but I think it's really important to take proper holidays. Like you get five weeks annual leave. 
I, I think I, the, the, the best thing for me was to use those five weeks to get out of the country. Now, I didn't do it all at once. I used to break it up and, you know, take like two week slots. And it worked perfectly because two weeks, I felt, was a really good time frame to feel that you'd had a separation away from, you know, your normal work work life. And then the other thing is um, uh, it's you sort of have to develop <laughs> the confidence to be able to give away some of the work that you were sort of doing yourself. Like don't micromanage your staff because that's just, extra stress for you train them up well and then have the confidence that they'll actually be able to do their own thing no harm in checking up on them i have you know monthly meetings if not fortnightly meetings with um with my um my secretary just to check that everyone's on the same page and that we're meeting our targets there's nothing wrong with that but you know you often won't have time to do a daily check-in um, so you just just got to sort of be a bit practical about those sorts of things. If you've got sp kids, spend time with your children. They grow up too fast. Spend time with your spouse. You know, at the end of, at the end of your surgical career, the people that are going to be around and that are going to make your life happy are a loving spouse and your children. So you've got to make sure that you do everything you can can to maintain good relationships because that's going to make life happy for you in the long run sorry if i seem like i'm preaching but um they're just you know um snippets of of reflection from my own personal experiences and um i hope that you know they're helpful and patrick and i are always around if um anyone's going through any any difficulties, particularly with setting up their own private practice, to be able to, you know, share our thoughts and um, um, and be a listening ear. So please don't forget us. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, I'd like to echo everything you said. Um, the, the key, uh, as, as surgeons, we are actually very good at adapting. So what if we're routinely doing something? Uh, both Mello and Long have raise some very important issues here and uh, we can adapt to this we make make time work for us the other thing I want to uh, say is that uh, uh, one of my teachers always told me there are only 24 hours in a day you, you know you can only fit so much in unless you live on Jupiter or something like that but you know there, there are only 24 hours and the day will change the day will end and then you'll come and start again the next day but give yourself some time otherwise you're going to be uh, what Mello was saying, you're know, completely burned out. No, so totally agree. Um, please ask for help. Please talk to us. Uh, Rax is here for everybody. Um, that's part of the reason we're, we're, we're doing what we're doing. Uh, but reach out to, uh, to uh, groups like uh, the VDHP and uh, also to Mello. Uh, talk to him. He's got the wealth of advice, I'm sure. Um, would you like to add anything else, Mello? with regard to that? Uh, I'd like to answer one of the questions there from in the chat box where it says all of these suggestions seems like um, surgeons don't really have time to do. And I, I really think we have to make time. I, and I ask myself every single day, what have I done for myself today? What have I done that's just for me? And, and that's why I'm a big one on just, just choosing one thing and just choose one thing that you'll stick to and, and it's your not negotiable habit, whatever it is, because I know we can get busy with other people's um, you know, problems and the work that we're doing and get filled up. But if you don't do something for yourself every single day, you will burn out. I'm sorry to say, and I've seen it. I've seen it from experience that in the work that I do. So, um, yes, just Absolutely. make some time. Like you said, Patrick, we only have 24 hours in the day. You can afford one hour for yourself or half an hour for yourself, whatever it is. Well, my, my boss used to um, love the American uh, gridiron and uh, he used to sleep from about uh, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. until 2 a.m. And then his time is 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. watching American gridiron. So that's his time. But he's got, he's got his sleep. He's got something to eat. He's done his job. And he's got to uh, watch, watch football. You know, well, what else can go wrong, right? 
Uh, that's brain surgery for you. <laughs> uh, okay, so Long, anything else to add? Uh, nothing too add, really. Just we're, we're here. And, you know, there's, we're not the be all end all. There's, there's plenty of other services out there, but we kind of like to think of ourselves as the, the safety net. So, you know, if, if you don't want to go anywhere else, you can come to us. And we, we, we're trying to make sure that no one falls through the cracks, basically. That's our kind of motto there. Yeah. I also like to add, uh, thank you very much for that long. I also like to add a uh, comment um, uh, with one of the questions about not finding time. It is very daunting when you start. You know, you feel like, okay, I, I need to work, work, work. Otherwise, I'm not going to get the, uh, the referral. I'm not going to get the, uh, the surgery. Oh, uh, I'm not going to earn a living. But eventually, it's, it's very hard. It, it, it's easy for us in hindsight. But if I knew then what I knew now, then it would be completely different you will be able to find time. Even if it's half an hour, we're not asking for a lot. We're just you know, half an hour, one hour a day, doing something simple. And, uh, and, and Patrick, I was just going to add, uh, a good friend said to me once, you know, um, a career in surgery is a marathon, not a sprint. So it's really important to make sure that you're fueling yourself appropriately to last the marathon. Mm, Self-caring self is really important. Pacing, right? Mm. I've got a question for Melo. Um, so if you saw one of your friends or colleagues uh, reaching the red zone, is, have you got any tricks yeah, to, to approach them as opposed to, oh, okay, you're looking tired. Uh, you should have some rest. Have you got any tricks you know, that we can help? Yeah, yeah, well, that's the worst thing to say, isn't it? You're looking tired because it, <laughs> it makes them feel worse. Um, no, just asking you know, that same, a bit like the are you okay type situation, you know, How's things at the moment? Any challenges? And it could be also, you know, it is putting them on the same level. Is it is a difficult time right now? We're all going through a bit of a, you know, troubled time. So, is there anything I can do to help? So it's more like reaching out, letting them know that you're there. And I think listen, listen, listen is the big one. Listen to their to their story if they could open up and just um, open up the conversation in a safe, um, practical way. I'd say. Long, anything to add? Any, any, any tricks for the BDH page? No, there's no real tricks. There's no kind of magic question, right? It's just kind of engaging and, and like Melo said, actually just listening mm. and, and making them feel comfortable enough to, li to listen. So um, I guess one of the things that we've, I've done personally anyway, so it's not clinical or anything here, is that I'll, I'll offer something, you know, to make myself vulnerable. And then that, that kind of gets people to kind of get them more inclined to offer something as well. So, you know, go, look, I'm feeling pretty stressed out this time. I haven't been sleeping or whatever else. And, and, and just having that courage to be uh, vulnerable and, and show that vulnerability kind of makes people feel okay to go, oh, okay, you know what? It's funny that you say that because I feel the same way. And, and it, it gets the ball rolling in that sense. It it's, must be yeah. difficult in this situation with social distancing and, you know, wearing masks and stuff. It, it, you know, it's very hard to talk to someone mm. uh, close, let alone uh, be open about it. But uh, I think, I think we'll, we'll adapt. We'll find a way. Another, another, good, another good way, Patrick, on that, on that note is a walk and talk, like just go mm. for a walk. And uh, especially males, I, I find a lot of the work that I do with males, they like to stand side by side. And if they are going to talk, you know, just so it's, it's not it's not opening the conversation of, you know, you're looking tired or you're looking haggard. You need to say, hey, do you want to go for a walk tomorrow? Or, you know, and open up the conversation like that. And people do with movement. When people get moving and start walking and build a momentum, they open up a lot more and, and chat a lot more. That really helps. And we're allowed to do that because we're we allowed to. We're allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> we're safe we're legal we won't get fined it's okay <laughs> um, um Marilyn, I just, yeah, yep. yeah i just wanted to um um uh put in a real plug for the wonderful work that bdhp do i actually um um have referred colleagues to contact bdhp um since it since it first started and um you know, I think it is a great service that is provided. Um, it didn't exist um, when I first started as a surgical registrar. It, it's something that um, has, you know, come to fruition since then. The doctors that work for VDHP who give, you know, counselling and advice and support, they all do it 
pro bono. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, it's a great initial step just to be able to have a sounding board um, if, you know, if you don't quite know what direction you need to go in terms of getting further assistance with your problem. Um, and, you know, you can basically ring them with any type of problem, which is fantastic. So um, I would urge you, all of you, you know, yourselves, if you ever feel kind of, you know, um, in that situation where you're not quite sure where to go, give BDHB a call and let your colleagues know about its existence as well. Yeah, yes. all of yes, please do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all the contact details will be on our website. Uh, both uh, Mellow and uh, the BDHB will be on the on the website. So please look in on them. Um, I noticed on the chat, not a lot of people put down their non-negotiable. Interestingly, 60, 70 percent of those that wrote down were, were brain surgeons. Okay, <laughs> so we can adapt. We can adapt. We are good at adapting. Right. So. Um, um, now, I'd like to take the uh, opportunity to thank Long and Mello for their fantastic talks. Uh, very insightful and thank you very much. a lot of discussion. Uh, I wish people would put more non-negotiable on the chat. Jeez, <laughs> come on, get into it, guys. Uh, thanks so much. Um, uh, Marilyn, any final comments at all before I sign off? Uh, nope, okay. So to everyone, to all the attendees, thank you so much for attending this uh, first webinar series uh, for P4P. Uh, it's difficult to set aside time uh, as um, as everyone has spoken today, uh, but over the past six weeks, I think it's been quite useful, uh, the topics that we've put to, together. Uh, and I hope that it's helped you to uh, start thinking about your new surgical practices. Um, I'm hopeful that we will be uh, continuing to run these series uh, in one form or another uh, next year. So please spread the word to all your colleagues and final year trainees coming up. Um, the online platform seems to work really well, but uh, I think formal face-to-face -face, uh, workshops should be brought back in certain, certain situations. So like today's workshop would have been fantastic as a face-to-face. -face. Um, keep an eye out on the college website of, uh, of changes and upcoming webinars and also upcoming workshops. Uh, all the webinars you've seen for the last six weeks should be on the website, so you can review it. Uh, missing any uh, important contact details, it's all on the website. Uh, we always welcome comments and feedback, as well as, as well as suggestions, so please let us know in the feedback form, uh, or even contact the Victoria State Committee directly with any advice or any comments. Uh, finally, um, in this current situation, please promise me that you will all stay safe and say well, uh, so we can get through all this together and emerge better for it all in the future. So good night and uh, thank you to everybody involved and uh, thanks once again. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.